Hello, Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell Barnard. Hello. Welcome to Donostia. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being with us. So thank you for sharing your time with Technopolis. Let's speak about your famous invest investigations of pulsars. Uh, you were uh, in, I think it was in 1967, you were uh, searching, but not for pulsars or mm. any kind of, of stars, but uh, for quasars. That's what 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 was the point of uh, looking for quasars at the time? At that time, it had only very recently been recognized that quasars were extremely distant, very, very far away. Uh, we knew that they were powerful radio sources. Okay. And if you put them at a great distance, how can they look so strong? They must be incredibly bright. So suddenly they were very, very interesting, very curious, a hot topic. Yeah. But we didn't know so many of them. But my thesis advisor, Tony Hewish, had a good way of finding more. And <coughs> it was to do that that we built a radio telescope, our own radio telescope, and started using it. And with hindsight, we can see that that telescope and the way we were using it was going to be a good way to find pulsars. But of course, at the time, we had no clue that pulsars existed. Absolutely no <laughs> clue. Del espacio llegan señales. Y para entender el universo, lo único que hay que hacer es interpretar esas señales. Bell Bernal buscaba una de esas señales, la de un quasar, pero encontró otra diferente, la de un tipo de estrella desconocido en aquel tiempo. Era un pulsar, una estrella de neutrones que emite señales en pulsos regulares. En realidad está continuamente emitiendo ondas de radio, pero en una sola dirección y debido a su rotación, a la Tierra llegan pulsos como la luz de un faro en el espacio. Bell Burnell fue la primera en detectar esa señal. You were using a radio telescope uh, in the UK, in the United Kingdom. Uh, that place is famous for the heavy weather, the rain, <laughs> the fog, uh, yeah. just like the Basque Country. Yes. Is not <laughs> <laughs> a dull, uh, good place to, to optical uh, astronomy. That's right, yes. But what about radio astronomy? Radio astronomy is a completely different story. Uh, during the daytime, the sun does not dominate the sky. Uh, if we had radio eyes, we would not see a particularly bright sun, and we could still, still see all the stars and galaxies beyond the sun. So radio astronomy you can do in the daytime, and the night time, and clouds are not a problem either. The radio waves come through the clouds. So in climates like ours in Britain and yours here, you can do radio astronomy. Oh. The problems there are radio interference, things like mobile phones, microwave ovens, these all make radio waves. And if you have a big sensitive radio telescope, it can pick these things up. So you need to be somewhere away from lots of people and, and cities. When you picked the signal, it was a very regular one. Yes. Uh, it was uh, uh, the, the first hypothesis about it is that <laughs> that signal must be something else, not the stars. Mm. The first signal was so peculiar that it was hard to know what to believe. So you start by suspecting there's something wrong with the equipment or that it's interference, but we established it was not interference and it was not a fault with the equipment. Another radio telescope at the observatory picked up the signal and gradually you try checking one thing after another. And gradually we came to realize that whatever this was, it was way out in the Milky Way galaxy beyond the sun, beyond the planets, but still within the Milky Way. So it began to look like some kind of star. And then after three or four weeks, I found another one in a different direction. And then it really does begin to look like some new kind of star, once you have two. And a few weeks after that, I got numbers three and number four. 
what would have happened uh, if just you have picked uh, just one signal? I mean, uh, it's very difficult to know what to do when you have one of something. It's very hard to make a convincing announcement. People will always suspect that there's some fault with the equipment that you have not noticed. So finding the second one was really very exciting. That was that was the eureka moment, finding the second one. So you call this signal Little Green Man One? Yes, but that was a joke. Ah, there was a joke. Um, and the one tells you that because we also had Little Green Men 2, 3 and 4. <laughs> and there are not four lots of Little Green Men, all signalling to this not obvious planet Earth, using a crazy frequency and a stupid technique. It, it was a joke, that name, but unfortunately, I regret now <laughs> making that joke. <laughs> anyway, there's a very difficult way from uh, Little Green Men to actually neutron stars, mm. which you didn't know at all at that That's time. Right. That's right, yes. There had been some people, crazy theoreticians, who had said, you know, these things might exist, but they'd be impossible to see. So nobody took any notice. Mm. <laughs> but it's what it turned out to be, mm. yeah. How much time do you need to for the conclusion that, that that's a neutron star? It's not evident. That, no, no, that didn't really come for another six months. Um, when we found a pulsar in, the, well, we, when astronomers found a pulsar in the Crab Nebula, and they were able to study it sufficiently that they could see the pulse gradually slowing. Now, if a pulse gradually slows, it means it's something rotating. If it was something vibrating, as it gets tired, it gets faster. Okay. But this was getting slower, so it was something rotating. And that meant it had to be a neutron star. Mm -hmm. But it was fully six months before yeah. we had the data that showed us that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you and, uh, and I don't know who invented the name Pulsar. Uh, that's a historic moment <laughs> in your life, in the life of science. The name Pulsar was invented by a journalist, a science journalist. Uh, when the paper announcing the first Pulsar was published, there was a lot of interest, and we spent a lot of time doing interviews. And one of the people who came to interview us was the science correspondent from a right-wing newspaper called The Daily Telegraph. His name was Anthony Michaelis. Mm. And he said to us, what are you going to call these things? And we hadn't thought about it. <laughs> we already had quasar, as you know. So he said, what about pulsar? Pulsating radio star, pulsar. And he wrote it up on the blackboard to see how it looked. And it looked OK. <laughs> so pulsar, it became. It became. A final question, one final question uh, dealing with your career and your famous uh, awards and not awards, the, mm -hmm. the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. uh, uh, of uh, Ant Anthony Huish, uh, you say? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, and I, I find that some kind of parallelism, but it's not the same story, but uh, with Rosalind Franklin's uh, history. El trabajo de la investigadora británica, Rosalind Franklin, fue crucial en las investigaciones sobre la estructura del ADN. Utilizando la técnica de la difracción de los rayos X, Franklin obtuvo varias imágenes de ADN. Una de ellas puso a James Watson y Francis Crick tras la pista de la verdadera estructura del ADN. El científico Maurice Wilkins facilitó a Watson y Crick la conocida Foto 51, pero lo hizo sin la autorización de su autora. Diez años más tarde, Watson, Crick y Wilkins obtuvieron el Nobel de Medicina. El galardón reconocía su contribución al descubrimiento de la estructura del ADN. Aquejada de cáncer, Rosalind Franklin había fallecido tres años antes. En el acto de entrega de los galardones, nadie hizo mención a su trabajo y tuvieron que pasar muchos años 
hasta que los tres científicos laureados comenzaran a citar públicamente el trabajo de la investigadora fallecida. Rosalind Franklin died very young. She had died by the time there was a Nobel Prize for that piece of work. Um, but whether she would have been included, I don't know. We can only guess. Um, yes, not many women have had Nobel Prizes. But then there are not so many women of my generation doing science. Yes. I hope that in the future there'll be many, many more. Mm. My opinion, well, it's a worthless opinion, but mm. I think she wouldn't have received the, the, the prize. I don't know. You may be right, yes. <laughs> yes. The way the things were developing, I suspect you were correct, yes. Mm. Mm. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for, for giving me the, the possibility of being with a fantastic woman. Thank you. And uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much and thank you for your interest too. <laughs>